Now it's time to talk about the next major, major design implication of the Junos operating system, and that is the separation of the control plane and the data plane. And I'm not talking about just a logical separation. No, I'm really kind of talking about a physical separation of the control plane and the data plane. It's almost like if we took the hood off of this Juniper EX2200 device, we would find basically two separate devices operating in here. And that's why in these virtual environments like EVNG, we actually have two separate devices. In this nugget, we're gonna uncover what does that really mean when we separate the control plane from the data plane physically and how Junos is designed with this separation in mind. Let's get going. Now it's time to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about about the Juniper operating system and architecture, and that's the separation of the control plane from the separation of the data plane. When we think about the control plane, we're thinking about how does our network device control how traffic is sent from one end to the other, or how does our network device behave when certain traffic arrives? That's the entire point of the control plane, is it's the brains of the operation. It's what makes the decisions about how this network device should treat traffic as it's coming in and going out, or how it treats traffic that's destined to itself. This is a major talking point. Whereas with the data plane, what we're talking about is the actual traffic itself that's traversing through the network device. That's what the data plane is all about. We separate these control planes and data planes physically on a Juniper network device. That's why you actually see here on the screen this little dashed line here. This dashed line is a illustration of the physical separation between the routing engine and the packet forwarding engine. The, the routing engine is the brains of the operation that controls the routing plane. The packet forwarding engine is a physical device also that is what makes decisions on how to forward traffic. Again, I'm only talking about one physical appliance here, right? I've only got one switch, but if we took the top off of the switch, well, it'd probably just look like a circuit board, a motherboard with a processor and stuff like that. But what's really happening here is there is a physical appliance in this switch that has a routing engine, and then they are linked together over an internal link. You could think about this almost like an ethernet plug, plugging one into the other. That's kind of how you're thinking a patch cable. They're patched together, even though this happens on a circuit board. And that's what connects it to the packet forwarding engine. So the way the routing engine works, oftentimes abbreviated an RE, is it's all about maintaining and managing the actual control plane itself. For instance, when we learn about new OSPF routes, you see this RT written on the table, written on the diagram right here. This is the routing table. The routing engine is what's going to maintain the routing table itself. So if we have a destination subnet, and we've learned the next hop address through OSPF, we've gone through the OSPF algorithm, and we know the next hop, that's what's going to populate our routing table. But from there, the routing table gets translated into a forwarding table. The forwarding table is all about quickly identifying the exit interface for the next hop address. So it takes the routing table and it optimizes it, so to speak, so that it works with the actual physical hardware and the platform that we're working with. So if we know the next top address is some sort of subnet and that would go out this specific interface, that's kind of what the forwarding table is all about doing. So the routing engine takes the routing table and it creates the forwarding table. And then you can see on the diagram here, it punts a copy of the forwarding table down to the packet forwarding engine. So the packet forwarding engine now has the forwarding table and when traffic comes in, it knows to look at the forwarding table and it knows which interface it should send it out to. Now there are some intricacies and some exceptions to that rule and that's what the next couple nuggets are all about. This is just about setting up the actual architecture of our Juniper devices. They're all built this way where the routing engine is physically separated from the packet forwarding engine, but the routing engine is all about building the forwarding table and then sending a copy of the forwarding table down to the packet forwarding engine. In other words, the routing engine manages the packet forwarding engine. Now let's actually see this in practice in a virtual lab environment. Now I've pulled up my EVNG environment and I have a blank topology here on the screen. What I want to do is illustrate that these really are two separate appliances here that are operating under the hood of one physical appliance. And that's actually how you virtualize a lot of these devices. 
In the previous skill, we showed the opportunity if you wanted to follow along in virtual lab environments, here's how you could go about downloading the images. And I did say that the VMX, the router appliances, and the VQFX, the switch appliances, are actually two devices that you download and set up. Here's why. If I actually go to add some nodes, down in the Juniper section here, you can see where my mouse is highlighted. The VMX VCP, that's the control plane. The VMX VFP, that's the virtual forwarding plane. Then in the VQFX appliances, you actually see we call it the routing engine and the packet forwarding engine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a VMX VCP for the control plane, which is also the routing engine, and I'm just going to add it onto my topology. And then I'm going to add the VMX virtual forwarding plane appliance onto my topology. One kind of looks like a router, a little router image here, and one kind of looks like a switch. Let me zoom in a little bit so we can see this a little better. And let me just horizontally align them so it's nice and pretty. Now what I have to do is I do have to physically connect these two together like as if it was an ethernet switch. In EvenG's topology, we actually use the INT interface to make this an internal connection to each other and we click save. So when I boot these up, here's how it would actually work. The VMX VCP, or the routing engine, is where we actually configure the devices themselves. The VFP, or the, the data plane, does nothing more than forward packets. So if I add a second node onto the environment, I link them together over the internal interface, I can start the appliances, and then when I actually want them to communicate to each other, I would use the forwarding plane to actually link these interfaces together, maybe over gig E000. However, when it's time to jump on the CLI of these devices, I would use the control plane itself. So we can see the device is still coming to life. Fair warning, these are some pretty large images and sometimes they do take a few minutes to boot up, but we'll let it boot up for just a moment and then we'll actually verify that it's up and running. Okay, it did come up, it did boot up, and first thing we can see right here, see this line that I'm highlighting? Free BSD. Guess what? There we go. We're re-highlighting the situation again that we're in where this boots up in a free BSD environment. Then we also see this amnesiac. What is that all about? Well, whenever you see amnesiac on a Juniper device, that means it is in its factory default configuration state. Now, it's going through some warnings here where it's trying to do an auto upgrade. We can fix that later. We'll get to that in a future skill. The big thing that I wanted to highlight right now is that this is running on top of FreeBSD, and the amnesiac is telling us that we're in a factory defaulted state. I simply typed in the login username right here of root, and it brought me in to the Junos operating system. Again, highlighting it here on the screen. It didn't prompt me for a password, and that's again how we know that we're in the factory defaulted state, because once we've entered this, we do have to set a root password. Again, that's going to be covered in a future nugget. We don't need to worry about the initial configuration right now. This is really all about highlighting that this Juniper operating system, this VMX appliance that we've brought to life, we're connected to the control plane node right now, because that's where the brains of everything happens, and it is communicating internally over a physical interface to the forwarding plane or the packet forwarding engine. In reality, it's just one appliance, just like this switch right here, but under the hood, it's basically two, and that's to separate the control plane from the packet forwarding engine, or the routing engine from the packet forwarding engine, I should say. And that way, you could actually lose one and not lose the other. Something that goes wrong in the routing engine would still keep the packet forwarding engine up. And we're going to talk about that more as we progress through this content in the JNCIA, why that's really a big deal at the end of the day. For now, this sets up the fundamental essence that the routing engine is separated from the packet forwarding engine, and the routing engine is what manages the packet forwarding engine by creating the routing table, then creating the forwarding table, and sending a copy of the forwarding table to the packet forwarding engine. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.